I think that Kasparov and Karpov are the greatest chess players of the second half of the 20th century. Karpov has the talent of a researcher, Kasparov that of a player. They're like animals when they play. They look at each other and sniff each other. They are players to the core. 1984-1990. The Karpov-Kasparov duel began just a few months into the reign of Mikhail Gorbachev. They battled for the world championship five times, the longest and most intense combat in the history of chess. Their duel began in 1972 with a ground-shattering event for their country, the USSR. In Reykjavik, Iceland, the American Bobby Fischer beat the Russian Boris Spassky, stealing the world championship crown that the Soviets had held for decades. To restore their honor, they searched their enormous pool of resources and fished out a young 20-year-old genius, Anatoly Karpov. They were to meet in 1975, but the fickle Bobby Fischer demanded so many conditions for the match that he was forced to forfeit. Anatoly Karpov became world chess champion by default. Obviously, I wanted to play this game. This is not the issue. And I was training to do it. No one can say that there wouldn't have been a fight. Because to go to Fischer, I had beaten all the serious players. I had played 60 games with the best players in the world, and everywhere I had proven I was better. Okay, Fischer didn't want to play, whatever the reasons, but anyway, all the others, I had beaten them. For Karpov, the fact that he had won the world title pleased the Soviet Union, but on the other hand, he had won without beating the official world champion. It is a black mark in his career, but it is not his fault. When Karpov won the championship title, he was given the title, I mean the wreath of the world champion. And Brezhnev made a speech. You grab the crown, hold on to it, because you know, it's a pitiless battle for such a crown. You grabbed it, don't give it to anyone. He spoke in front of all the high-ranking sport representatives, which meant that instructions had to be followed. Karpov was it. Period. Anatoly Karpov was the ideal champion, a product of the Soviet Union. He was born in 1951 in deeply rural Russia, Zlatost in the Urals, son of a housewife and a worker who had risen to the rank of metallurgist engineer. In other words, Anatoly was 100% Slavic. At school, on playgrounds, kids are tough. There's a lot of bullying from older boys. On the other hand, Karpov is small, subtle, but Karpov likes to be at home. His father plays chess and teaches him how to play, and the boy gets the best grades in school. His triumph over those who had bullied him that gave him great satisfaction. He came to know that extraordinary feeling of the superiority of intellect over rough physical strength. And that's how he built a strong will, you know. At 12 years old, this frail young man entered the prestigious Botvinnik School in Moscow, climbing the discipline's ranks to reach the world title. As of 1975, he would rule the chess world for a decade. To the great satisfaction of the Soviet authorities, he even beat the dissident Viktor Korchnoi twice in the world championship finals, but he never beat the American Bobby Fischer in his entire career. 
1976 in Tokyo, Karpov began secret negotiations with Fischer to set up a match. The Soviet team coach, Alexander Nikitin, learned of it and denounced him to the authorities. Karpov was furious, demanding his head, and he got it. Nikitin sought revenge. At that time, the Junior USSR Chess Championship was to take place in Vilnius. The team of Azerbaijan was there with his big husky guys. And suddenly, in the middle of them, like an old little guy, then tall guys again. And I was precisely interested in the one in that hole. That's how I discovered Kasparov. We started to see each other from that moment on. Kasparov was about 10 years old then. This Garry Kasparov, whom Nikitin had just taken under his wing, was very different from Karpov, who was 12 years older. Garry was born in Baku, Azerbaijan, a satellite state of the USSR. His father, Kim Weinstein, was Jewish. His mother, Clara Kasparova, Armenian. Both were petroleum engineers. Kasparov's father introduced him to chess when he was five years old. When he was seven, tragedy struck the family. His father died of cancer. Raised by his mother, Gary abandoned the name Weinstein for her maiden name, Kasparov. In temperament, Gary was the polar opposite of Karpov. It was a hellish mix of Armenian and Jewish blood living in an Azeri environment. I must say that for Gary, his behavior was harmful to himself in some ways because he spent more energy than he needed to. He was restless. Ruled with an iron hand by his mother, this impetuous young man soon garnered every possible success in the junior category. In 1974, at age 11, he was granted the honor of playing against the USSR title champion in a Young Pioneers tournament in Leningrad. I remember there were seven players in the team, and everyone lost. I was the only one left in front of the You know, being left face to face with such a champion, it was extraordinary. There were a lot of people around us. And when I found myself in front of him, it was no longer just a session, it was a showdown. The moment I felt that, psychologically, I realized I couldn't fight anymore. I lost, and I was very depressed, because I had very good positions, I was playing very well. No one could have imagined that from this game on, the face-to-face -face would continue for so many years. Kasparov had the first chessboard. And I was playing against him in this game. I thought I had won, but I didn't because he played well. And the game must declare a tie. In the world of chess, it's not a question of chance. It means that people don't become champions overnight. You can identify them when they are young. And Karpov knew that about Kasparov. We knew he would become a champion when he was young. Anatoly Karpov was received like a king everywhere in the USSR. He had a plaque dedicated to him at the school in his native town and played numerous exhibition matches. In contrast, the nomenclatura viewed the young Azeri Jew Kasparov's ascent with suspicion. The Russians prefer that Karpov remain world champion, for sure. But they also see that Kasparov has incredible talent. He's 19 when he plays in the Russian team, which means that at 19, he's among the four best players in Russia, although there is an extraordinary talent pool there. Of course, in the Soviet Union, there are power struggles. Kasparov has support among the Soviets, less powerful than for Karpov, but still very powerful. Haydar Aliyev was a bigwig in the Azerbaijan regime, a Politburo member and vice president of the USSR ministerial cabinet. His support enabled the young Kasparov to rise to the top. It was now inevitable. The special K's would confront each other.
Lorsque commence When this epic battle starts cette grande Kasparov bataille Kasparov, épique entre Kasparov et Karpov, l'Union soviétique est déjà Indeed, euh, très essoufflée. Il y avait une force brute qui a permis de détruire l'industrie et de battre les Allemands. Mais également, il y avait une intelligence et rien ne symbolise mieux aux yeux des soviétiques euh, end, cette intelligence que le jeu d'échecs. Et au fond, l'idée, c'est bien notre économie est baisse, well, notre économie ne va pas bien, mais on a encore les champions d'échecs. September 10th, 1984. Garry Kasparov eliminated the other contenders and faced Anatoly Karpov. This World Championship final took place in the famous Pillar Hall in Moscow, where Liszt and Tchaikovsky had performed. The Karpov-Kasparov meeting was first of all a clash of styles. But it was also a battle between two completely different psychological profiles. The match had no time limit. Victory would go to whoever won six games. Karpov, c'est plutôt quelqu'un nice de glace, qui cache ses émotions, qui se contrôle. Euh, moi, je me souviens, par exemple, la première fois que je l'ai vu en 82, et je m'étais déplacé pour les Olympiades, et je l'ai vu en étant à côté de lui il y a 10 mètres, j'étais glacé, quoi. C'est très dur de jouer contre lui. Il dégage quelque chose. Les deux dégagent à leur manière quelque chose de très, très fort. Par exemple, Kasparov, c'est plus quelqu'un de feu. Son objectif aux échecs, c'est de détruire l'autre par l'attaque et par une stratégie brillante. Karpov, c'est quelqu'un qui va plus peut-être euh, entourer l'autre dans quelque chose qui va le, comme on dit, comme un boa, qui va l'étouffer et qui va petit à petit prendre le dessus. Voilà. I understood that for a player, it is very important not to show your mood. Your feelings during the game. You have to keep your self-control all the time. I think that initially, I'm very emotional. I'm ready to take risks. That's how I am. My style was established. It was linked to the will to go on. To me, life is an attempt to always discover something new. On paper, the strengths of the two players did not appear equal. Karpov was backed by the Soviet Chess Federation president Vitaly Sevastyanov, cosmonaut, best man at his wedding, and one of the great Soviet masters. Kasparov did have Aliyev's support, but with a reduced team of coaches. Karpov, better prepared, completely dominated the first part of the match and quickly took the lead, four to nothing. In the first game, especially in the first half, Kasparov was absolutely incapable of hiding his feelings. And Karpov could clearly see when his opponent's position was better or when it wasn't very good. And obviously Kasparov wasn't happy with that. You could see him wiggling in his feet, putting his head in his hands or madly scanning the audience, looking for me. Because I usually was by his side. You can say that Karpov psychologically won the first game 100%. I thought I had more chances. I underestimated Karpov. And I think that it was a psychological mistake. Karpov was 33 years old. I was 10 years younger than him. So without me, he would really have been a very young champion. After nine games, the score was 4-0, and I realized that something needed to change. You didn't need to be a scientist to understand this. I realized I needed to play differently. I needed to play for time and make a series of tight games to become stronger to acquire more self-confidence and to learn how to win against Karpov. The contender for the title was reeling, he didn't know where to turn. 
both Kasparovs, mother and son, ignored their coach's advice. They had to act fast. Their protector, Haydar Aliyev, rushed Azerbaijan's greatest medium to the scene, a KGB man. We scheduled an appointment at the Hotel Moskva. Gary was staying there. I asked him, Gary, why is everything going this way? Why are you losing? What's your feeling about this? He answered, together with his mum, we didn't know he was so strong. We underestimated him. The game is over, he said. I'm going to lose it. Surely I'm going to lose it. But I hope to make it last a little bit longer. Because if not, it'll be a real shame for me. And I tell him, with five to zero, you want to quit? He answers yes. So I say to him, well, at five, I start to help you. You won't lose the game. I'm not saying you're going to win. I say you won't lose. When I'm in that room, it'll be a tough atmosphere for Karpov. He'll have a hard time playing. Meanwhile, Karpov patiently waited for his impulsive challenger to make a mistake. It was the 27th round. Karpov was now leading five to nothing. Kasparov was no longer seeking victory, but just to restore his honor. Besides, Karpov was particularly under pressure. His team and his supporters were telling him, So Tolik, can't you finish him off? He was obsessed. He wanted to win 6-0, because he knew that with his southern disposition, Kasparov would not be able to survive after the humiliation of having lost. And he said, there will be a 6-0, I go on. He's going to lose by himself. I'm not moving a little finger. Kasparov's strategy of gaining time and playing games to a tie began to bear fruit. Like a boxer on the ropes, he protected himself and let the champion slowly wear himself out. If I had won the 31st part, the game would have ended with the score of 6 to nil. I didn't win it and I lost the 32nd. As you say in soccer, you score a goal or you let in a goal. Thunderbolt in the pillar room. Kasparov finally won a round. After that, Karpov, dazed, endured two months of tied matches. And then, the unthinkable happened. Kasparov won two rounds in a row. Now the score stood at 5-3. to three. In February, after six months of heated battle, Karpov had lost 10 kilos and was groggy. I was playing better and better, while he was losing his self-confidence. And I think this led to an uncontrollable game. That's why the Soviet sport nomenclature decided to stop the game. They didn't really know how it would end. The outcome wasn't clear. They saw that Karpov was getting tired. And thought that anything could happen at that point. They knew that anything could happen. As for me, I was rather encouraged. President of the World Chess Federation, Florencio Campomanes, a Filipino well-versed in greasing palms and manipulation, was chosen to announce this fact in a press conference with the two players present. That is when Kasparov decided to climb on the stage. Your decision is a joke. It is a farce. The match must go on. Everyone knows I can win it. And those who interrupted the championship have to For the first time in the USSR, an athlete publicly rebelled against the system. In the USSR, to publicly oppose the authorities' decisions was inconceivable. So making that declaration on stage turned the chess player I was into a politician. Because the system could not afford for that kind of statement to happen. I was lucky. I was in the right place at the right time. Because in another era, it would have been sheer suicide. I didn't think about all that. Today, I can say, that day and those moments made a different man out of me. 
Of course, the situation was seen differently in the Karpov camp. They accused Kasparov supporters of setting up this manipulation. In fact, it was Kasparov who wanted to interrupt the game. With the score of 5 to 3, he was scared. It's an open secret that during the Soviet period, the sports committee was not independent. It was answerable to the central committee of the Communist Party. Decisions were made at the level of the Politburo, or Aliyev, which officially supervised science, sports, medicine, and all humanitarian fields at that time. And if Aliyev gave an order, how could a Gromov or anybody else contest it? The Federation could take decisions only when no order had come from above. And if there was an order, the Federation had no say. Caught between protests from both sides, Campomanes hastily organized a meeting between the two players. Karpov first refused to sign the papers stopping the match, then yielded to the officials' insistence. Karpov is a man who is very law-abiding, and that's another important point. He respects authority. I don't know if it's right or wrong, but that's how he is. Apparently, that's how they won their case, by pressuring him. Karpov wanted to stop, and after Kasparov refused to sign, he started to shout louder and louder every day that his victory had been stolen from him, and that he was ready to start the match over the next day. So more than one person said there is no winner. What does it mean, no winner, with a score of 5 to 3? But Kasparov obtained the right to not go through selection competitions. If I had beaten him, he would have had to go through all tournaments, and he would have confronted me not one year later, but three years later. After the first match was cancelled without a winner, a new final was planned in Moscow once again. It was to take place seven months later. Meanwhile, the political situation had changed in the USSR. The doddering Chernenko, successor to Brezhnev and Andropov, died on March 10, 1985. 54-year-old Mikhail Gorbachev succeeded him. Soon, perestroika would become the regime's new doctrine. At the time, Garry Kasparov was the rebel in the eyes of the world. On June 3, 1985, he made another move into dissidence by granting an interview to the magazine Der Spiegel, a capitalist reactionary propaganda organ. Kasparov, Kasparov is no longer the Kasparov on the stage during the first match, making a scandal. He is the Kasparov who became some kind of anti-ambassador of Soviet chess playing. That's to say that Kasparov breaks a taboo. He speaks to the media like any other top-level athlete in any Western country. He says Kampomanes is a vassal of the Federation. He says the match, that the fact that it was stopped is outrageous, that he should have won. He says the rules of the game should be changed. The Soviet Federation felt bad. It upset Karpov and his gang. It also disturbed negotiations for the upcoming game. Kasparov was totally out of control. Anatoly Karpov had read the interview and was now very sure of himself. He told everyone who would listen that there wouldn't be a second match. For what I know, Karpov completely stopped training for the game in 1985 because he was sure that after the outrageous interview I gave Der Spiegel, the Soviet authorities would most certainly disqualify me. But the winds of change were blowing through the Soviet Union ever since Gorbachev took power. Thanks to Alexander Yakovlev, the new Politburo member and a champion of perestroika, Garry Kasparov avoided the two-year suspension the Chess Disciplinary Committee wanted to impose on him. The match would indeed take place. The entire Soviet Federation was in fact behind Karpov. They hoped he would come out winner of the second round in Moscow. 
I believe this annoyed Kasparov to the point of him wanting to win the match at any price. The champion doesn't want to lose, of course, but he had a political drive. The second battle between the special K's, as they were being called, started on September 3rd, 1985, in the Tchaikovsky room. The air was crackling with energy. To avoid an interminable match, this time they had to fight 24 rounds. The victor would be the one who won the most. In case of a tie, the world champion would keep his title. This time, I felt very self-confident. I was sure I was going to win, thanks to the quality of my training and the understanding I had of my opponent. Everything was coming together. I was on top form in every way. I was in a good mood. I had good energy. When the match started, it was perfect. I won the first game using a new system. I think that Karpov wasn't very focused at the beginning. Ultimately, I think that I had more ideas and that I was more physically prepared. And the genius of Kasparov is that actually, as he himself explains, he analyzes his own mistakes very, very well. Something that Karpov didn't do. Because Karpov had dominated the world chess for so many years, Karpov is not as hard working as Kasparov. Kasparov will do 12 hour training sessions until he finds where the problem lies. He drained, he drained his colleagues because he is such a ball of energy. Uh, he exercised, etc. Uh, uh, with Karpov, it's not at all the case. Karpov wakes up at noon, uh, while uh, his voilà, rhythm is completely uh, different. The two champions were neck and neck until the 15th round, when Kasparov widened the gap. With only three games left, Karpov was two points behind. During those three last sessions, he had to play twice with whites and once with blacks. He managed to win one session playing with the whites, which brought the gap down to one point Kasparov was leading four to three. Everything depended on the 24th and final round. True to his temperament, Garry Kasparov took maximum risks, deploying all his aggressiveness in the attack and won by a hair. He became the youngest world chess champion in history. In the audience, one man was in raptures. I felt a great emptiness because I understood that the job was over and that it had been done well. When the sport committee fired me because I had revealed the secret meeting between Karpov and Fischer, I had sworn to wring Karpov's neck. And well, I did it. I will never forget what the great chess master Petrosian said to me at the end of the game. I feel sorry for you, because you just lived the best day of your life, and now it's over. I still remember this, because to the young man I was, who had become world champion at the age of 22, these were strange words, full of wisdom. You can't go higher than being world champion. You can only go down. Kasparov hardly had time to enjoy his title when Florencio Campomanes insisted on a rematch in three months' time. Kasparov refused, asking for a longer delay. I found this unbelievable. I didn't understand why and how he was allowed to have another chance. The match for the title of world champion should happen between the current incumbent and his strongest opponent, the new candidate to that title. There is no evidence that the champion who just lost his title would be the most relevant person to be granted the right to another game. He should have proven it by his results. 
uh, an automatic right to a second chance seems highly questionable. Despite everything, the game was organized. Karpov told me he was ready to play. As for me, I had the feeling I was having a bad dream, and it was quickly explained to me that I would be disqualified if I refused to play. This time, the match would take place in two different cities. The first 12 rounds would be played in London starting in July 1986, and the next 12 would be in Leningrad. This third match was marked by dirty tricks, attempts to create pressure and reciprocal intimidations. Even worse, Kasparov's bodyguard unit, managed by KGB Colonel Viktor Litvinov, suspected that there was a spy in the team. We really felt that there were some leaks from our side, and we didn't like it. Litvinov was fully aware of what was happening. In London, Kasparov was greeted by Margaret Thatcher. He perfectly illustrated the relationship the Iron Lady was trying to build with Gorbachev, being a respectable man, according to her. As a result, Karpov was seen as Brezhnev's apparatchik. Right from the start, he surprised everyone. He played aggressively, which was not at all his style. We're entering a, a sport era, and Karpov understood that in order to win, he had to work really hard. He needed to change his work methods. He needed to organize all his staff for the training sessions. He needed to have a, a private cook, for example, things like that for his dietary needs. So all the things you don't see during a chess game, which mean that you must have a well-oxygenated brain during five hours. Kasparov had a different opinion about his opponent's new strategy. When I played new moves, I had the feeling that after the fifth or sixth game, Karpov was playing with me. I would do something. And I had the feeling he knew what I was thinking. It was hard to prove. But at some point, I told my coaches we had to find an explanation to this strange feeling I had. Debutant result is not. Kasparov adapted to his adversary's new strategy and played defense. As a result, he led 2-1 when the match continued in Leningrad. In Leningrad, the atmosphere was awful. Municipal authorities and everybody who was linked to the organization overtly helped Karpov. We could feel a very strong psychological pressure. Of course, I have a different attitude today, but 25 years ago, it was much more acute for me. This was the atmosphere in Leningrad as Kasparov was dominated by Karpov's new aggressive style. The audience was rooting for Karpov with cries of, kill him, kill him, Karpov. The game didn't go well for me in London, but in Leningrad I managed to win three times in a row, and Kasparov had never lost three times in a row against anyone. He was shocked. His mother calls me, it's always like this. She starts talking a bit. Then she hands the phone over to Gary. I say, Gary, what's going on? Tofik Gasanovich, we are off to a bad start, he says. Karpov started to play very well. We don't have a new strategy to offer. This is a tough situation. Dadashev felt many positive things, but it was not decisive enough. Obviously, people sometimes have a strong ability, but they cannot create something that does not exist. If you believe in something, they can influence you, but if you don't believe, it will be useless. I lost the 17th, so I used a new system for the 18th, and Karpov reacted in a weird way. 
But even so, I should have won. I could have ended the game, but instead I ruined everything after three moves. Right after that, I realized that I had to rethink the whole match. I tackled the problem and started to understand that Karpov had a sound source of information. We reached a draw, and it is at that time that a spying campaign broke out. They said to themselves, if there isn't any spy in our team, how come Gary could lose three games in a row? Is it not possible unless someone sells them information? They snatched all the wires in the room. Supposedly, they were hidden microphones. In the Kasparov camp, a spy hunt was launched. We decided to remove the telephones in all the hotel rooms. Cell phones didn't exist at that time. That's what we decided. And then one day, after an obtained suspicion on Gary's part, Clara Kasparova decided to call Vladimirov in his room to verify. All the phones were supposed to be in manager Litvinov's office, but Vladimirov picked up to answer. That was it. He had kept a telephone. We fired him straight away after that incident. That's how it happened. In fact, the biggest impact of an assistant's betrayal in chess playing is not really the contents, it's the psychological impact. I would say it's, it's as if your own son betrayed you or denounced you for something that is not quite correct. You can expect anything, but not from someone in your own family. The Vladimirov story is, is really rubbish, but the persecution mania was in full swing on the subject. It is true that Kasparov won the last game brilliantly. You have to admit this. In the 22nd, I found the winning move. The game was in progress, and I had to analyze all possible combinations on the chessboard. And suddenly, I made a move that allowed a really nice combination, and that was it. It erased all my previous failures. Five victories to four. Kasparov was crowned world champion at last. His reign could finally begin. The next year, Garry Kasparov was in Seville, Spain, for the launch of the 1992 World Expo. He thought he was finally finished with his old adversary, but he was wrong. Tough as a boy, Karpov showed that he was still the only one able to compete with the new world champion. My case is unique because after I lost the title, I stayed on top. It is something really rare that no world champion has achieved during the 20th century. That is, coming back and playing again in a game for the world championship after losing a title, and for a long period, it never happened again. In Seville, it was extraordinary because for the first time, Soviet teams played the entire game outside of the USSR. It created a new situation. The media could talk directly to athletes. We would hold many press conferences about every game. In order to realize the interest there was for this event, you could watch the games in Seville live on Spanish television. It was obvious that in Seville, there was a deeply political dimension to these games. And because the Soviet Union Everybody was fascinated by what was happening in the USSR, and the games were part of the perestroika process. Kasparov launched the hostilities by publishing an autobiography just before the match. He portrayed Karpov as a man of the past and puppet of a corrupt system doomed to disappear. This book was too provocative. I was 23 when I started writing it. 
Опять, не надо забывать, мне было 23 года, когда к ним подписался. Я был чемпионом мира, я чувствовал себя а, как бы на седьмом небе, в большом количестве сил. В СССР шла перестройка. Думал, будет реформа, появился ассоциация гроссмейстера. То есть перемены были. Вот я вот был символом этих перемен, и мне хотелось скорее об этом всем рассказать. Вот когда торопишься, всегда получается не лучшим образом. Encouraged by his mother, who managed the team with an iron hand, the young world champion had become arrogant, sure of himself. You understand, as he was getting older, as his success as a chess player became more and more remarkable, Kasparov had a greater and greater opinion of themselves. They considered themselves as the most important people. They thought everything depended on them, that they could call the shots, and that coaches were not coaches anymore, but associates. At age 36, Karpov was still highly motivated and far from finished. He took control and stayed ahead until the 24th and final round. He only needed a tie match to regain the world championship title. In the 24th and last game, objectively and statistically, the probability of Karpov being world champion again was very high. It certainly was around 70 to 80 percent. Because when Karpov wants to block the system to go to tie, he is extremely good at this. So Kasparov will have to break through Karpov's impressive defense with few chances to succeed in reality. Karpov sits in front of the chessboard and, and at one point in the game, I can see that in his eyes that a move has escaped him. He didn't quite realize which one, but he understood he had missed an opportunity. That specific moment, I read it in his eyes. And he's going to play and play. He's going to increase his advantage and end up winning. Il va sauver, enfin, il va sauver sa peau, il va faire 12-12 et conserver son titre. Donc cette, cette dernière partie, elle est, elle est remarquable dans le sens où Kasparov a cette capacité à, à gagner dans les moments importants. Kasparov a été le roi de chess pour trois ans, une célébrité mondiale de chess. Il a construit son image publique avec des exhibitions, conferences and publicity. He injected new life into chess, bringing it into the business of sports and developed computer programs. Meanwhile, his country, the USSR, was crumbling. Gorbachev had failed, but Estroiska and Glasnost only impoverished the country. Opening up the economy was a fiasco. Store shelves were empty. Kasparov distanced himself from the regime. He only believed in Reagan and Thatcher. During those years, the inflexible Karpov piled up his victories, so much so that in 1990 in New York and Lyon, once again, faced Kasparov for the fifth time. In New York, the setup matched the Big Apple expectations. Et la presse pour le public américain, ils vont façonner euh, euh, une image euh, assez manichéenne. On a d'un côté one side we have Karpov, qui est le, le communiste le décoré de l'ordre de Lénine par Brezhnev, euh, membre du Parti communiste. Et de l'autre côté, on a Kasparov, l'enfant du changement, anti-communiste, anti -communiste, sympathique, nice guy, souriant. Et en fait, and le, le, les médias media américains vont beaucoup jouer là-dessus. Karpov published an autobiography a few days before the match, repayment in kind for Kasparov's murderous book. Three years earlier, he settled the score between himself and his adversary. During practice, Karpov wrote a book, pretentiously titled My Sister Kaisa. You can see his style, as if he belonged to a family of gods. When the book came out, I didn't read it in order to avoid any frustration, any psychological frustration. It was easy for me. He wrote a book, so what? I stayed focused on the upcoming match. Kasparov said very harsh things against Karpov. 
envers Karpov. Par exemple, For il example, a dit que Karpov, Karpov était un être de la life. nuit, malfaisant, uh, uh, avec quelque chose de diabolique en lui. Uh, you know, enfin, il a dit des choses like comme that. ça. Et Karpov, Karpov a répondu en disant qu'il avait de la chance qu'il n'était pas lui-même citoyen américain, sinon il l'aurait poursuivi en justice. During the competition in New York, Kasparov liberated himself politically. He created his own party and to highlight it, refused to play under the same flag as his adversary. To me, refusing to play with the Soviet flag completely matched my political position. I remember this story. As I can remember my mother making a Russian flag with I don't know what, because such a flag didn't exist. And when we arrived at the American TV studio with a handmade Russian flag, this caused a scandal. Because the International Chess Federation didn't want that flag. Советская делегация протестовала, the и компромисс protested. был uh, после четвертого тура, то есть Фиде убрал флаги вообще. Away all the flags. Флаги были убраны, like ну, что меня в принципе no устроило. Flag. Советского флага не было. Вот. Uh, um, я носил значок с российским флагом. Flag. Вот это... Ну, во-первых, тогда флаг не был российским. Flag. Этот флаг был We непонятно. Really Но вообще по истории это военный флаг. In brief, this flag was never acknowledged and it broke all rules. And because politicians don't always abide by the rules, I stood against that because it was no part of the rules. In the end, the grand show fizzled out. When the exhausted duelist battled in Lyon, neither one could come out on top. They knew each other too well. There was a Frenchman among the Karpov coaches. Le plus impressionnant, c'est euh, le calme de Karpov. Karpov, c'est quelqu'un de très, très très calme, who is very, euh, very qui a calm, aucun who moment n'a élevé la voix après une défaite ou parce qu'il était en colère, euh, si un coup n'avait pas été mal analysé. Jamais je n'ai vu reprocher quelque chose à quelqu'un. Euh, J'ai entendu d'autres champions euh, parler, il y en a qui s'énervent, enfin, je veux dire, ça peut créer des, des situations explosives. Voilà, très tranquille, c'est ça sa grande force. C'est un super match, c'est sans super égalité, match. donc jusqu'au bout, il y aura eu un suspense. Et euh, dans la dernière la partie, game, Kasparov, Kasparov a les blancs, et il, il va jouer une partie tough. très dure, Karpov et euh, les nerfs de Karpov vont, vont lâcher. Kasparov, Kasparov va proposer nul, et Karpov est obligé no d'accepter. Là, il n'y aura pas de case, discussion no de rumeurs, parce que c'est normal. Avec la nul, il est champion du monde. Il gagne le titre avec 12 points et demi contre 11 points et demi. Le combat était très tendu, mais pour être objectif, Kasparov était then better as a chess practitioner. Furthermore, we have to say that Karpov had very important other activities. He used to prepare for a match at the very last minute. We arrived where the game was supposed to take place, and only at that time would he start working like a madman. Lyon was the special case swan song. It was the last time the two Soviet champions met in a world championship final. A year later, the Soviet Union collapsed. The game with Karpov was not a fight between the old and the new world. It was a fight between the Soviet Union and the new I think my victory by the end of 1991 became a very important symbol of change. It was as if Russia had won over the USSR, and many people understood it that way. It's been more than two decades since the red flag over the Kremlin has been lowered. Much time has elapsed. Today, Karpov is a Duma deputy, staunch supporter of Vladimir Putin's power. Kasparov has often been arrested in Moscow because he demonstrates against the regime, which he considers a dictatorship. He was even imprisoned for five days in 2007. That is when Anatoly Karpov wanted to visit him. He was not able to come to see me. Neither was my mother. 
Два из интермедиарии Карпов передал мне там журнал 64. Я помню, что когда начальник из тюрьмы мне принес журнал, сказал, что это от Карпова, я подумал, что это такая дурная шутка. Вот. Но потом оказалось действительно, что это Карпов мне принес шахматный журнал. Вот. Это для меня было очень важным знаком, потому что все-таки солидарность чемпионов мира он поставил выше, чем политические различия, ну и, в общем, все то, что нас в жизни разделяло. Почему я пошел? Why did I go? Ну, вы все знаете, как you know, it's a rather bitter episode for me, and not a very pleasant one for Russia. Вот, я считал, I thought we shouldn't act like we did. Kasparov's offense wasn't serious enough to put a world champion in jail. Во многом, как бы, позволило мне пересмотреть свои отношения к нему. Оно просто изрезка критического стало более взвешенным. И, соответственно, карповское поведение в тот момент его никто не заставил это сделать. Для меня перевесило очень много того негативного, что было в прошлом.